This is an interview with Ken Roush from Mrs. Whetstone's Senior English Class of Perry High School. This interview is part of an oral history of Vietnam called Project Vietnam. This interview is being conducted at Ken's home on November 21st, 1988. My name is Amy Barth. In what branch of the military did you serve? Uh, I served in the United States Air Force for four years. But for one year while in Vietnam, I was in the Royal Timing, so actually two different branches. Can you describe what the Black Beret was? Yeah, the Black Berets were a special forces group of Thailand military personnel. And uh, my duty being assigned from the Air Force at that time was to do forward air control reconnaissance for the Royal Thai Army. So therefore, that being the case, then we were, there was about five of us that were actually assigned to the Royal Thai Army to uh, give support to them while in Vietnam. Okay. And how old were you when you served in Vietnam? I was 19. And you stayed two years? In Vietnam, I was, I only stayed one year, but I had four years in the service. One year in Vietnam. Okay. And what was your highest rank? Staff Sergeant. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was your assignment while serving in Vietnam? Well, like I just stated previously, I was actually assigned to the forward air controllers uh, in Vietnam. I might add, though, that when I first got over there and was assigned, uh, I was assigned to the C-119 group, which, which were called the ranch hands. Now, to explain that just for a second, they were the group that put out the Agent Orange. These were the planes that flew over the jungle sprayed the Agent Orange to clear out the jungle and the grass and all that type of stuff. Well, I was assigned to them when I first got there. I was only in that group about two days and got reassigned to Special Forces Group with Thai Army. So, actually, I am lucky for not being in the Agent Orange group mm -hmm. that was over there because the things that have come up about the Agent Orange, I'm just glad that I wasn't around it. So, mm -hmm. I got lucky there. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. During what years was your tour of duty? Okay, uh, the tour of duty in Vietnam. Yeah. It was from uh, August of 1969 until August of 1970. Could you describe your first impressions of Vietnam? Well, I, the one thing that sticks out in my mind was course it's a long trip from here over to there and it was about 24 hours on an airplane of course it was commercial flights it was real nice but when you landed you land in Saigon and you're assigned from there I remember getting out the plane it was about 115 degrees and it just like took your breath away and at that point you knew you were in Vietnam because it was hot and uh, kind of muggy but that was my first impression then, uh, then came the mosquitoes, which were really bad. So those are all maybe minor things to everybody, but those are your first impressions when you get off that plane, is the heat and the amount of insects and things around that you have to end up coping with for a year. Nobody really knows what they're going to be assigned to. Nobody knows. No. no, you're actually assigned when you arrive over there. What about Vietnam was different from what you had expected? Well, I can't say that it was different than I expected. I hadn't, uh, you'd heard things from other people, uh, but it's, it's something that you have, you have to wait and see because you don't know what to expect. So everything, no matter what you expect, it was going to be, it's going to be different. Uh, I knew it was going to be hot. And, uh, it was. I didn't know what living conditions were going to be because you didn't know where you were going to be assigned. Could have been out in the middle of nowhere for the year, or you could have been on a base like Ben Law, you know, where they had nice facilities. So I guess I was anticipating the best, but that was basically it. How was your combat in Vietnam different from the fighting in previous wars? Well, the main difference is there was no front lines. You would, if you walk down the street during the day, you would be seeing the same guy that may be firing the rockets in at you at night when you're on base. So what made it extremely difficult was you never knew who was who. Uh, the South Vietnamese looked the same as the North Vietnamese. There was just no way of knowing. I know there was probably hundreds of times that I've 
went up and bought, uh, you know, bread or some kind of fruit or something from a Vietnamese, and, and he was actually a Viet Cong, Viet Cong soldier. You never knew. You never had that definite line, you know, of confrontation. It was just sporadic, you know, different groups out in this area and that area. No front lines was the biggest difference. What do you remember most vividly about Vietnam? Well, I think the main thing was the, uh, the number of rocket and mortar attacks that you were under from time to time. They never let you alone. It was always, there wasn't, at least where I was, there was never a day went by that you didn't have something scurrying you in for cover. You know, it was always mortars coming in. I would probably say I was there 364 days probably, and uh, out of that I was in probably 280 rocket attacks. So that I remember, and that sticks out in my mind. What fears dominated your life while you were in Vietnam? Well, there was always the fear of, you know, getting hit by a mortar or a landmine or anything when you're out off the coast. Uh, the fear of driving down a road in a jeep and just getting shot at from the woods would be no different than going down the street here and somebody shooting you through the car. Uh, that was always a big fear because you never knew, once again, where everybody was at that was, that was Viet Cong. So I suppose that was the greatest fear, was just never knowing at any one time if you were ever going to get hit. Mm -hmm. But you didn't let it bother you because it, it, it could really control your life if you yeah. let it bother you, you have to put it out of your mind. How would you summarize your feelings about the war? Well, my feelings are I never regret going over. I felt the time it was necessary and we had to have the people over there and I never regret it, proud of it. Some people like to complain about it, demonstrate against it, this type of thing, but whether the war was right or whether it was wrong, we needed to have people over there at that time. And those were the decisions that uh, the government made at that time, and I'm perfectly willing to accept those. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I wasn't injured and uh, made it back okay, but I'm sure had I been injured, I still would probably have the same outlook. I felt that it was necessary at the time. Mm -hmm. When someone mentioned Vietnam, what are, your, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? Well, uh, it all depends on who is mentioning Vietnam. If it's someone that's never been there, uh, then my first thoughts are, well, what is their impression of it? You know, how do they foresee it? And how are the, how do they expect me to, to react to it? You know, that's, that I was against it or for it or whatever. So I kind of listen first. And if it's from someone that doesn't, has never been there, uh, then just maybe kind of explain the ways it was. And if it is someone that has been there, you know, Everybody has their own outlook on it. Some people weren't happy. Others got along okay. Fortunately, I come out of it okay. What will you never be able to forget about Vietnam? Now, the one thing that did uh, probably upset me the most was there was one mission I was supposed to go out on. It was early in the morning, maybe 4 o'clock. And uh, I was supposed to be co-pilot with a, uh, a major. And uh, when I got up, I was sick. So I went out and told him that I wasn't going with him. And uh, went back to bed. Well, I was awakened a couple hours later that uh, they told me that that plane crashed and he was killed. So that always sticks in my mind that that was close to. How did you change as a direct result of the war? Well, I guess it, it makes you grow up quick. It makes you realize that uh, every day is kind of special. You know, you have to make do with every day as far as accomplishing something every day because over there you knew, you didn't know from one day to the next if you were going to be there. Uh, it makes you grow up pretty quick. It makes you realize that life is short and it's pretty precious. What is the most important thing you want people to understand about the Vietnam War? Well, I think the main thing is there's been a lot of talk about a lot of drugs in Vietnam, which there most certainly was. Uh, but I believe the misconception that a lot of people has that if, if you were in the Army or Air Force or Marines or whatever branch, uh, that you were on drugs when you were in Vietnam. Well, I was there a year. I knew a lot of people over there. And, uh, 
the percentages are nowhere close to what people say. Right. Naturally, it's no different from here in the States. You know, people in school will have that 10% that are on drugs and, you know, that type of thing. In Vietnam, you had the 10% that were on drugs. And they're really easy to come by. They were easy to come by. That's probably why it was so easy for a lot of guys to get on drugs. But uh, it's not, it wasn't as widespread as people lead you to believe. It, 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 you know, a lot of good people over there didn't use drugs. So that's one of the main things that I'd like people to know. Have you ever been to the Wall in Washington, D.C.? No, I haven't. I would like to. How were you treated by the American public when you returned home? Were there a lot of protesting? Yes, there was still some protesting because uh, uh, while I was in Vietnam, it was the Kent State incident. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, when I got back, there was still protesting going on. I didn't particularly like it because the people that were doing the protesting didn't know what it was like. Okay, they didn't. They weren't over there. They don't know. You know they didn't know. All they knew is uh, they were having a good time having a demonstration. Okay, and then they got carried away at Kent State. That was a bad incident. Uh, so, did they come to you personally? Um, we had some people in class, and they mentioned when they got off the planes, there were people waiting for them. No, not me personally. I don't think I had uh, anybody but family, you know, yeah. members that met me. Too. I guess that's one thing that is in the back of a lot of Vietnam veterans' minds is, uh, once again, you didn't have the fronts in Vietnam like you had in World War War One, World War War Two. So, you know, you went in, you fought, you did the job, wherever, and then everybody came home. Was your family real supportive? Oh, yeah. You, you got to come home a lot? Or? From Vietnam? Yeah. Oh, no, I never came home. You from never? There. You could never leave. No. Oh, you could never leave? No, there was no... no they, we, they did give you what they called an R&R, &R, which was a rest and recuperation. I got that after I was there for nine months. At that point, you were allowed. They would fly you anywhere in the country other than, other than the United States. So at that point, I did go to Hawaii for a week. I spent a week in Hawaii from Vietnam. But then once again, I had to go back for three more months. But uh, you weren't allowed to go anywhere just whenever you wanted to. It was only that time. Did the training you received in boot camp prepare you for the war? Yeah, it's hard to say that it fully prepares you. It prepares you probably physically, uh, but mentally, you're nobody's really ready to go to a place like that. Somebody can say to you, well, you're going to Vietnam, and you can, that can register in your mind, but it doesn't really register in your mind until you're there. Okay. So the training, yes, is, is sufficient. Of course, I knew I was a flight engineer while I was here in the States before I went to Vietnam. So flying was easy for me. There was no problems with that. But the psychological part of it, mm -hmm. of, of seeing, seeing people killed and seeing, uh, some of your friends while coming back and things like that. Nobody's ever really prepared for that. What did you learn about yourself as a result of being involved in the war? I think mainly was to the, the fact that you did care about other people. You know, uh, you never really get close to somebody until you're in a situation like that. You know, uh, for instance, the five or six people that were at the small post where I was, you become a family. I mean, you, uh, you look out for each other and make sure that you know that you don't take chances and go somewhere without your weapon or whatever like that. And I guess it's the closeness to learn that, that you learn that you can be real close to people mm -hmm. in an atmosphere. And I, I would imagine that helped after I got out of service too. Do you have any definite feelings toward the Vietnamese people? Yeah, I suppose in a, in a way I feel sorry for the South Vietnamese people. All that I met over there that were truly actually the residents of South Vietnam, and, uh, they had no place to go. They couldn't go you know, to some other country and hide. I mean, it just wasn't possible. And the little kids and things like that, I, you feel sorry for them because here the war is going on in their country. You know, we're here from the United States and the Thai people are here from Thailand and you know, the French are here from France and things like that. And we're all in their country, so you feel sorry for them. For, they may 
build a house which they think is great, you know, it would be nothing to us, but in the next day find it burnt down and blown up with a mortar where and they start all over again. So that was I think. Would you go back to visit if you had the opportunity? I would love to go back. Okay. Yes. I'd love to go back for a week or two. Go to some of the places that I've been Saigon. The Air Force Base, which is probably still there. I think perhaps someday you will. Maybe so. I hope so. When you look at an American flag today, what do you feel? Patriotic. Anytime I see it. Close to it. So you I'd think, do it again. Really? You think the war was fought in good cause? You don't yeah. regret anything about it? No, I don't regret anything about it. A lot of people it. have hard feelings and toward yeah. it and are really toward yeah. hard to talk about it. I know. We lost a lot of people over there. A lot of people. And I suppose if you were someone that did lose somebody, you would have those feelings. But at this point, I don't. Did you get to take anything home, like weapons or something to bring back that you could remember? Uh, first of all, you weren't allowed to bring any weapons back. I acquired an AK-47, which was a Russian-made gun that the Viet Cong used. Uh, but I was not allowed to send that home or bring it back with me when I came. Um, there was other items I bought over there. Uh, dolls in glass, uh, things, you know, just for, it was a Vietnamese culture type things. Of course, there were general items, cameras and things like that, but really nothing you were allowed to bring much of anything back. How did the Vietnamese Vietnamese women and children teach treat you? The, I found that they were very friendly. Um, the Most of the women had jobs like washing clothes or polishing shoes or being pooch maids or whatever. Uh, it's one of their, their main things. Uh, that was the way they made their money. Uh, for instance, I would have a, a hooch maid buy us, but I would pay her $5 a month. So very minimal, but it was a lot of money to them. I found them very friendly and open, and uh, they were also scared of the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong mm -hmm. troops, too. Why didn't we pull out of the Vietnam War early to avoid all the lives that we lost? Well, when you say early, you don't know when. when is early. You know, uh, we were in the war quite a, long, quite a number of years, but you never know when is the right time. When is the right time to get out? Mm -hmm. My feeling is we got out a little too soon. Other people's feelings in we were there 10 years longer than we should have been. Um, just never did know what, what, how, what, what makes the time right to leave. Um, we did start a transition period a couple of years before we finally did get out. The transition was to teach the South Vietnamese people how to fly airplanes, how to load the ammunition, uh, you know, how to run an air, or run a base, whatever. Uh, actually teach them how to fight and then we slowly progressively moved the first cavalry out the first airborne out and slowly start taking our troops away and letting out we're letting them have more and more responsibility well that took two to three years to, to get that training over with and uh, at that point which was probably in 72 or 73 which was the last troops and we brought out of Vietnam so if you say we should have got out early it's all in on who's eyes you're looking through because uh, I felt we stayed there the time that we were needed. Maybe we should have stayed a little longer. How do you compare the Vietnam movie to the real thing? I've seen two of them and uh, there are some things that are very close to the way things were there, but I would have to say that 90% of that was dramatized. Uh, they just they carried it a little farther than what it, what it should have been an actually quite that bad or? not quite that bad. There were probably instances that were that bad over there as compared to some of the movies that, that have been out. But I would have to say that um, most of it wasn't that bad. It showed a lot of points in those movies where uh, a soldier was would would shoot a woman or a child or something like that. No way. I don't, I don't think those type of things happen as much as they indicated in the movie. Most of them have been dramatized pretty much. Now, the one that I feel that is closest to actually what, ha what 
went on over there was one that's on TV and it's called Tour of Duty. That show was pretty much right on. You think Platoon was over dramatized? Yes, too? I do. Yes. Okay. It was too Ramboized. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't really. Didn't hit the money too good. For even me. even for the soldiers that were living out in the jungle for that's right. Weeks at home. That's right. So how did you get your food? Um, it's probably different from the soldiers that were living sure. like in the jungle. Did you just go to the store and buy it? No, we. Where I was at, there was no stores once again. We had no stores. We were actually, we would make a run each day into the Thai headquarters, which was about six miles down down a dirt road. Uh, that was their main supply post for the Royal Thai Army. And they actually gave us food. They actually would give us you know, eggs and just, or whatever, you know, that type of thing. Most of the time it was sea rations. The same thing that the uh, Army used down the field. With cans of baked beans and uh, you know the spam and that type of thing and the rolls and everything it all came in a can. Everything came in a can. We just heated up over like a Bunsen burner type thing. Was so it we had not food supply. We had all we needed, but it was basically it was just sea rations and K rations. We call it. They had dried, what I said called dried food. It was uh, in shrimp bags that were vac were vacuumed taken on. And they was like stew. It was like stew. All you did was open it and put it in a pan and pour water in it and heated it up and that was stew. Okay. So uh, it wasn't that bad. You could you could live with that. But uh, then there were times that the ties would bring us a case of steaks or something and then we'd have it made for about a week or so. But uh, eating was wasn't too much of a problem. There was enough people that looked after us and there was some stuff. So we didn't have to eat sea rations all the time. Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of communication between you and your family? A lot of letters written? And yeah, I would have to say every couple of three days. You'd either get a letter or, or you'd be sending a letter. Depending on all well, the activity of that week, uh, if you were just too busy, you couldn't, you know, it may go a week or so. But uh, normally, uh, every few days or so, you got a letter or sent one back. What I, what I did was kind of nice. I took a deck of cards and, uh, each week I would send one card home. And when I got down to the last card, that was 52 weeks and that was my year. So you kind of always knew where you were at. You'd send one card a week and you get down to Ace of Hearts, let's say. And you knew that was the last week you had it. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to share? Well, none other than the fact that uh, I can't uh, say that I'm sorry that I was there. Like I said before, I think it was necessary that we were there at that time. And uh, I'm sorry that they had the demonstrations like they had at Kent State. I can sympathize with the college kids as far as that goes. And, you know, I hated to see those things happen, but uh, I believe they got a little carried away on the demonstrations and that type of thing. And that's exactly what the communists wanted to happen in the United States was those type of demonstrations. They knew that they were, the longer they stayed in Vietnam and supplied the guns and supplies, the more demonstrations were going on in the United States and that's just separating people and putting the pressure on the government at that time to withdraw us from Vietnam. So they, the communists and the Viet Cong were getting exactly what they wanted through demonstrations in the United States. They were separating the people. And that's what made it bad. But I guess that's all. On behalf of Perry High School and the students involved in Project Vietnam, we would like to thank you for your time and contribution.